Welcome everyone to, uh, to today's panel session celebrating World Day of People with Disability. Um, a really important day. We're a little bit ahead of uh, the actual day, which is on Thursday, December the 3th. Um, but we wanted to um, acknowledge this day uh, as part of uh, the faculty's acknowledgement of people with disability and our interest in inclusion. Um, and bring together a group of people who have been working in the design fields uh, to look at the issue of beyond universal design. Of course, those of us who do work in design will have quite a lot of experience with the universal design principles. We want to explore their usefulness, um, their history, and perhaps their future um, across today's panel session. We're very fortunate to be joined uh, by four panel members. Um, I'll introduce them shortly. Uh, the format of the session uh, will include five minutes um, from each of our speakers, uh, followed by an open discussion and the opportunity for those who are joining us uh, to contribute uh, by asking questions through the Q&A format. I just want to pause briefly, however, um, to, to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of our lands and acknowledge um, the land on which this event is taking place, that of the Wurundjeri, and the Boon people and pay our respects to elders and their families. So without further ado, I'll introduce our panel. Um, they'll have about five minutes each to introduce themselves uh, and their work and their research and to introduce what they've been doing with respect to design for inclusion. The first of our speakers is uh, Professor Bruce Bonnie Hattie, the Director of the Melbourne Disability Institute. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much, Ben. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting today and to pay my respects to their elders, past, present uh, and emerging. As Ben said, I'm the director of the Melbourne Disability Institute, an interdisciplinary institute based at the University of Melbourne, really focused on improving the lives of people with disability their families and carers. And for all people with disability, whether they acquire their disability, for, had their disability from birth or they acquire it during life or they inquire it as they age, accessibility is such an important factor in them being able to live full lives. So it gives me great pleasure uh, to be part of this panel today. I would really like to talk about three things, focusing first of all uh, on a very important area of current work by the Melbourne Disability Institute. We've, we're working with the Summer Foundation, the Australian Federation of Disability Organisations, the Council of the Ageing and other key stakeholders uh, to try and change the building code in Australia to make all housing accessible. Currently, housing in Australia, the accessibility standards are all voluntary. This was a voluntary code that was entered uh, in 2009. And since its introduction, nothing has changed. We now have an opportunity to change the building code to make accessible standards mandatory because this issue is being considered by the Australian Building uh, Codes Board. And they will be meeting in March next year with ministers to determine whether we should have mandatory standards. We've done a lot of work on this issue and we've identified that uh, the benefits uh, of accessible standards far outweigh the costs uh, at what's known as the gold standard in the livable housing arrangements. We're now working with these other organisations and key individuals uh, to develop a, a campaign called Building Better Homes. Building Better Homes for all Australians. The website is buildingbetterhomes.org.au and we'll officially launch it uh, later this week. But this is a once in a generation uh, opportunity to change the building code. If we don't do it now, uh, it will be, a, we estimate at least another decade before we get this uh, opportunity again. So please look, go to search out our website, um, sign up, uh, write to your MPs because this is our opportunity to make 
uh, Australian homes all accessible in the future so that we future-proof uh, Australian housing. Some survey work we've done identifies that, in fact, this was the largest, we believe, the largest survey of people with disabilities that's ever been conducted in relation to accessible housing found that for 74% of them, their current housing doesn't meet their needs. 80% of them, more than 80% of them, have trouble visiting friends and family. And nearly one third have found that inaccessible housing has led them to be less have less opportunities to take a job or to work the hours they would like to work. The second point I just want to make is that accessible design helps everybody, not just people uh, with mobility uh, impairments. In the 1940s uh, in the US, they introduced curb cuts really to assist people with disabilities um, move from one pavement to another and across a street. But as we now know, those curb cuts benefit at all benefit all of us. They benefit um, families pushing a pram or a stroller. They push. They benefit people who are pulling a uh, suitcase behind them. So this point that um, accessible design benefits everyone is something that we need to pay, keep in mind as we think about how we prosecute the case for increased accessibility, because it's not just the benefits uh, to people with disabilities or the aged uh, that we need to take account of. And in fact, that's one of the key things that we uh, introduced as part of the work we've done on uh, accessible housing design, because the consultants that have been uh, employed by the ABCB had not identified all of the benefits. They'd identified all of the costs, but not all of the benefits. And the final point I just want to make in relation to uh, accessibility is to observe and comment on what's happening with technology, mainstream technology, our iPhones, uh, our smartphones more broadly, because all of these devices are now being developed uh, and um, designed so they can be used when people without disabilities can't see them, can't touch them and can't hear them. And so, of course, that's not just a benefit to people without disabilities, it's a great benefit to people with disabilities. But what it also means is that this mainstream technology can now be used very cleverly in many ways to make, air, make buildings and other things that were not accessible accessible. And so one example of that would be Blind Square, which is a technology that's being trialled here in Melbourne at Southern Cross Station, where people through their phones uh, can get um, receive voice instructions about how to navigate a very complex space in order to get onto the train that they want to get onto. But there are other um, many notable examples of how with phones, with Google Maps, with all of these other um, uh, applications, they're now being made accessible. And so for people who can't see or can't hear or who've got an intellectual disability, they can now get uh, signals and instructions right at their fingertips or at their wrist to tell them exactly where to go and how to navigate a complex world. So I think there is much that's happening, but there's obviously much more to do so that we really do get uh, beyond the universal design standards. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Bruce. And I think as you've um, so well pointed out, you know, design for disability is certainly um, me thought of as design for all. And I did note that the World Health Organization identifies 15% uh, of the world's population as uh, living with some form of disability. Um, so we're not talking about a, a small group, we're talking about a, a very, very large uh, portion of our um, communities and society uh, across the world. I'd now like to introduce um, Associate Professor Petra Glowen, um, of course, known to many of us in the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning as the Director of the Built Environment Learning and Teaching Group but also has done extensive work um, looking at design for disability as well. So Kate, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Ben, and um, thank you very much to, uh, the, to Anna and to everyone for the invitation to be here. It's terrific to be here and to be part of this, um, a part of this panel. It's really great to be um, highlighting 
uh, the International Day for People with Disabilities. Um, before beginning, of course, I'll pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands, the multiple lands on which we're meeting today and their elders past, present and emerging. I'm going to talk today very briefly as an introduction um, about my experience as a designer and as an educator working in interdisciplinary research projects with this particular focus. Um, really, just to kind of kick the conversation off, I think it's really helpful to talk about the collaborations and some of the ways that I think design skills have contributed in these because I think it really opens a whole lot of opportunities for um, people who come from those backgrounds. Um, I will attempt to get my machine to work, which is always challenging. Here we go. Um, so I've been working in um, this kind of research since about 2012. I'm looking at supported housing options for people with disability. I've had many collaborations over that time, primarily with a fantastic and excellent colleague, Libby Calloway at Monash University. Um, and we've expanded the people that we've been working with and including um, Bruce here, of course, um, uh, over a series of projects. So there are three main projects that I'm just going to super quickly talk about. The first ones with the blue dots are a set of projects that we have been conducting for the um, Transport Accident Commission. Um, and that was, in fact, one of those that started this off. Um, the second set is a project that we did uh, for the National Disability um, Strategy looking at um, called My Home Space. So I'll talk about that. Um, and then the last is um, some projects to support the TAC's client housing strategy. Um, so clearly there's not enough time to talk about any of these in any detail, but I hope to really highlight, I guess, the contributions that design has brought um, into, um, not just through me, through other designers, into these kinds of challenges. Um, the residential independence Group Propriety Limited um, is a limited housing investment trust by the TAC um, looking to develop um, supported housing models for people with disability who have particular capacities for independent living um, across Victoria. So they've, they've developed a bunch of housing approaches over the last several years and we've been developing a post-occupancy evaluation strategy um, and a framework and then applying that to various of these models. To do that, it was important to really be very strategic about understanding what it was that those investors and that group wanted to achieve and then to engage with people with disability to understand how successful that was. And we used design approaches as well as other kinds of approaches, including those coming from Allied Health, as a way of really richly understanding those experiences. Um, through that process, and you'll see down the bottom, there's a website link that um, links off to many of our projects. Um, through that process, we've been able to um, assess and then rate each of these projects um, according to that framework. But we've also been able to develop some really um, interesting ways of communicating that. So we started, and this is back in 2013, making um, uh, 3D panoramas of virtual spaces that not only could present the spaces that people were living in, but something of the experiences of the individuals who were living there. So this is a resident who's in a wheelchair. And so the veiled areas shows what that person can actually reach the green spaces are people who are in that space, so support workers. That For that person, there is always someone in their laundry and as a way of understanding what privacy looks like in this space, it's really important to engage with that, I think, not just on a physical level but on an emotional and a social level as well. Um, the other project that I just wanted to quickly talk about is uh, this project called My Home Space. Um, this was a way of unpacking uh, the um, SDA requirements um, for designers. And so we did that by looking at the way that um, these uh, new uh, strategies were being applied um, in the way that um, housing could be designed for investors and then developing a virtual game space. So this game space is a way to present virtual spaces and also the limitations for designers. Um, so it's this particular version of it is showing how um, uh, um, technologies can be, can be controlled and also included um, and then a range of ways of assistive technology to, um, being, being used in this space to support people living. Um, that has then formed the basis for some 
good conversations and also a way to educate, and this is where I kind of come at it from an educational background um, as well, a way to kind of educate ourselves about what the actual design limitations are. So coming at it from that direction as well. The last thing that I'll talk about um, is some, um, or introduce at least, is this project, which was um, some research to support the TAC client housing strategy. This was quite a large and complex um, project um, in that it involved a whole range of different people. Um, you'll see um, myself and Libby Calloway who led this project, um, uh, people from Monash University, people from the University of Melbourne, including the Melbourne Disability Institute and others. Um, it, it essentially produced all of those different reports but it did that by looking across um, international literature and grey literature, particularly looking at um, supported housing models over the last several years, and then um, bringing together people to discuss implications um, for motor accident insurers, housing and support, um, and then developing a design approach. So um, through doing all that scanning, we were able to get a good understanding of what housing options looked like, and then to develop a really clear um, set of descriptors in the form of personas, linking in with our work from the post-occupancy evaluation work and a set of precedent models. So by doing that, we could kind of cross-reference them and start to provide some guidance about the kinds of housing models and the implications they have for various parts of the TAC cohort. I'm going to leave it there, but I really hope, I guess, to be talking about all of the things that designers know and what designers bring to some of these really complex challenges. Thank you very much, Ben. Thanks so much, Kat. It's been a tremendous sort of body of work that you've managed to put together and um, hopefully we're introducing that to some people who, um, who may not know about it just yet, but uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll be following it up uh, any moment now. Continuing, I guess, the theme um, a little bit about housing, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Andrew Martell, uh, also a lecturer in uh, Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. Um, and I'll hand it over to you, Andrew, to introduce yourself and some of your great work. Thanks, Ben. Um, thanks, Anna. Um, so I'm Andrew. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that um, uh, we're having our presentation today on Indigenous land. Um, and welcome you all here to the um, International Day of Persons with Disability panel. Uh, if we could go to the next one, please, Anna. So I'm a housing researcher, um, and just to give you a bit of a background about what what I'm up, been up to for the last sort of four or five years, um, I just want to run through, similar to Kate, just three of my current projects uh, to give you a bit of an idea about what kind of thing I do. This first one is called Fit for Purpose. Uh, we got funding for it from the Hallmark Affordable Housing Initiative, which is really good. Um, and it's really about looking at all of the different regulations that impact on the provision of housing for people with a disability. So as you'd expect, that includes building regulations, it includes regulations around disability, regulations around tenancy, and importantly for us, regulations around human rights and how do human rights regulations interact with building regulations, for example, and those kinds of things. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Anna. So this isn't a, a, an exhaustive list by any means, but it was all I could fit on the page. But these are all of the different codes, guides, regulation, acts of parliament, both at a commonwealth and a state level that have some impact on how we can build uh, housing for people with a disability. And you'll see that it um, you know, covers things from the, the National Construction Code to Australian standards, the NDIS, but also planning, tenancy, occupational health and safety, a whole range of things, some of which reference universal design and, and others which currently don't. And Bruce mentioned briefly the um, National Construction Code at the moment doesn't reference um, universal design, but hopefully that will come in at some stage. Um, if we go to the next one, please, Anna. So what are we hoping to get out of this? Well, we're hoping to shed some light on the really complex interaction between rights-based and performance-based policy provisions, particularly ones that influence the quality and the cost of new housing for people with disabilities. That's, that's really what we're interested in. How do we maintain quality and keep costs down? Um, we're also, you'll all be aware that the Commonwealth Government's position um, is that the private sector should be providing most of the new housing for people with a disability and people who are ageing. Um, and so we want to provide a sort of practical point of reference for prospective market entrance and also influence sort of future government opportunities. 
Um, and with projects like this, we have a, a whole bunch of industry partners working with us. There's a really opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer engagement from stakeholders from a wide range of sectors. So that includes government, development, finance, law, et cetera, not-for-profit um, in this, what is a really still an emerging market uh, in, in Australia. And, and if you want my personal opinion, I think we need to be able to build coalitions across these different sectors in order to get this kind of housing actually built. Uh, thanks, Anna. The next project. Oh, thank you. The next project um, we've done in conjunction with uh, the Summer Foundation, who do extraordinarily good work. Um, and what we did was an audit of accessible features for new built house plans here. So the previous project is all about regulation and the kind of framework around building housing for people with disability. But another way to try and get a handle on where universal design is in Australia at the moment is to have a look at what's being built. And so we identified um, 20 of the most popular volume built um, houses on the market at the moment. These are all being built um, in Australia, in Melbourne. Um, so they were display homes. We went out, we measured them all up and we looked at how many of them actually met the different criteria for the living housing design elements. And it's a little bit hard to read this table, but you can see on the, the left hand uh, column there, that's all the different house types we looked at. And all those gray, gold and blue squares are different elements of the universal um, livable housing design guide that were met at either silver, gold or platinum standards. So what you can see is that actually there's a lot of standards that are actually met already by the houses that we build, but there's also a lot that aren't. And so if we go to the next slide, there are usual suspects, including entrances, which are a really big problem where we don't have uh, universal access and those kinds of things. And when you do projects like this and you have a look at where people are meeting criteria that they don't have to meet, because as Bruce mentioned, this is still voluntary at the moment, and these are not designed for people with disability. These are standard housing options uh, for people in the market at the moment. You find some quirky little things that happen. So if we can go to the next slide, Anna. When we looked at the, that set of housing, none of the dwellings that we looked at met the standard for internal doors and corridors from the living housing design guidelines. So not one. But as the uh, guidelines suggest, it's, it's a two parts to this guidelines. There's internal corridor space and also the internal doors. And when we split them up, we found that 70% of the dwellings we looked at actually met the corridor space standards, but none of them complied with the internal door dimension standard. So the corridors were fine for people in a wheelchair, but they just couldn't go into the living room or the bedroom or whatever it is because the doors weren't big enough. So there's a lack of coordination rather than a lack of ability to meet the design guidelines. And so houses can meet five, six, seven, eight of the different guidelines out of 14, but still not operate properly for people with a disability because they're not coordinated, they don't meet the right ones. That's looking forward. So thank you, Anna. So that's looking forward, but you can also look back and see um, <clears throat> where we've been, how we've been designing in the past and what that has meant um, as far as universal design goes. And so, uh, this project called Accessing the Home was, um, we got some um, funding from Melbourne Disability Institute to have a look at this. Um, its full title is Collecting and Analysing Reports from 17 Years of Victoria's Home Renovation Service. If you don't know what the Home Renovation Service was, um, it was um, a program run by the Victorian government, whereby if through disability or age related issues, you needed to have your house modified, your existing home, then the um, Archie Centre, uh, funded by the government, would send an architect and an occupational therapist out to your home to look at your home, interview you, and then put together a report um, uh, recommending the kind of modifications uh, that the house needed. So we collected about 14,000 of those reports. Uh, they've got a lot of really interesting data in them. So we are able, by using that, to assess the extent and type of modifications that are required. And it was a statewide Victorian scheme. So we've got geographical um, data. So we know which of the regions and which parts of Melbourne these houses were. Uh, there's data on housing types. So were they weatherboard, they have tile roofs, those kind of things, the age of the house. Um, we have sketches of the designs that were recommended and an approximation of building costs. So a lot of really good data there. Um, so we go to the next page, please. So when we start to analyse these things and we start to look at, well, what needs to be done in these houses and how often do the same things need to be done? And for me, this slide is um, an initial 
uh, look at 200 of those reports. And if you look at the bathroom in the centre column there, you can see the total of 79 of the 200 houses um, required modification of the bathroom. The column next to that is called combined. That's where there were more than one modification. There were 29 of those in this data set. My guess is most of those included the bathroom. So we think that 100 at least of the 200 houses in this particular survey required their bathroom to be changed. Yep. Yeah? So that allows us to, to um, you know, have empirical data around, well, which parts of houses are most critical? Yeah, and you can see their ramps, getting through the front door, bathrooms, other ones. And then we can go back, use that data to look at what we're building now and actually assess whether um, things are moving forward or, or they're not. So I think I might leave it there. I think that's the last slide. Um, and I look forward to the discussion uh, that's upcoming. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, great to, to, to bring some of these issues uh, into the pragmatic and to, to demonstrate some of the, the um, really interesting evaluative work that you've done. So thanks very much for that. Uh, finally, uh, our last panellist is um, uh, Panita Thakur, who's doing her PhD currently in our faculty. And of course, uh, design for disability goes well beyond um, facilities themselves and into the urban realm. And with that, I'll hand over to you, Panita, to explain yourself and a little bit of what you've been doing um, around urban design and planning. Uh, all right, as Ben said, my name is Punita Thakur and I'm a PhD student in the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. And I'm really excited to be part of this special day which celebrates the achievements and uh, contributions of persons with disabilities. I will talk to you about on a topic that interests me both as an urban designer and as a mother of a son who was in a wheelchair. I would often accompany my son walking through the streets of Melbourne CBD, sometimes commuting to Melbourne Uni where he was also pursuing his PhD and at other times just wandering on the streets and watching what we used to call a street ballet. So it is not surprising that my research topic is on wheelchair accessibility to public spaces. Currently, in the production of spaces that are inclusive of wheelchair users, barrier-free design and universal design are the main policies. Barrier-free, as we all know, is to remove the physical barriers in accordance with the legal codes and standards and focused only on disabled user. Whereas universal design is seen as a good approach that benefits everyone. However, it is not without criticism. And I tend to side with researchers who think Universal design is partial in understanding the interrelationships between dis disability and design. And that there's a gap in translating the theoretical studies of universal design to architectural practice. And this focuses primarily on physical accessibility and usability, and I will call it mobility reductionism. Today, we all aspire for happier and healthier societies unless we look at the social, psychological, and emotional needs, this cannot be realized. What I think is that for built environments to be truly inclusive to persons with disabilities, so that persons of disabilities can achieve their full potentials and capabilities, we need to bring discourses of happiness and joy into our urban studies. And this is precisely what my current PhD research hopes to do. It is titled Pursuit of Happiness for Wheelchair Users and the Case Studies of Melbourne CBD. Happiness, I know, is a very tricky word. And in literature, there is no consensus on it. So you might wonder what happiness means for my research. For this research, happiness is not extreme peace with oneself, not high attainment, or a mystic or sensual experience. For my research, it is just a state of mind when one feels well most of the time and is having an enjoyable and satisfying experience when positive emotions exceed the negative. My current PhD research is in very, very early stages. In fact, my pre-confirmation meeting is a fortnight away. And unfortunately, I don't have any results to show you. But what my current research proposes to do is 
it has two distinct parts. The first one is wheelchair users and their consumption of public spaces. And the second one is co-production of public spaces, which can promote wheelchair users' happiness. And the objective of the first part is to map history of wheelchair accessibility in Melbourne streets. The current history maps it through the chronological orders of legislation, acts, policies, with few exceptions. This is important, but I feel it is incomplete. And we need to see this history through the spatial subjectivities and perceptions of wheelchair users. Uh, People with all disabilities are important, but my focus is on this PhD research is just on wheelchair users. And the understanding that we will get from this uh, will help us to identify the indicators to happiness for wheelchair users in their use of streets, and which forms the base of my second part, which is co-producing an evidence-based evaluation model to measure the happiness index of wheelchair users as they negotiate the streets. And in this pursuit, wheelchair users and urban designers will be equal co-producers, the equal stakeholders. Currently, the accessibility outcomes are measured and through access auditing and how much minimum standards have been achieved. But what I feel is, that, uh, I mean, I will find this quote by Nobel laureate Stiglitz very relevant. What you measure affects what you do. If you don't measure the right thing, you don't do the right thing. So in my research, I aim to go beyond physical accessibility and take into account the social, psychological, and emotional aspects as well. Through my research, I hope to make provide wheelchair users a happy and an enjoyable experience of negotiating streets. Uh, I just want to give put a smile on their faces because I think a smile is a measure of happiness. And Ben, that's all from my side. Thanks very much, Veneta. It, it seems like you're very heavily invested uh, in, in the wonderful research that you're doing. We'll come back to talk about that more shortly, no doubt. What we're going to do now is we'll, we'll open um, the Q&A to questions and we'll try to pick up some of those questions that people watching uh, may like to ask our panellists. But we also have um, some other questions we're going to discuss of a more general nature and um, we'll try and intersperse any of the questions which are posted in the Q&A um, amongst uh, the broader discussion. I want to come back to you, Bruce, and, and perhaps just pose this first question, which um, you know, others please join in and, and, and share your perspectives as well. But I wonder, are we experiencing a shift in our sort of cultural expectations around design for disability um, over the last few years? It seems that there may be an acceleration of these expectations. Um, do you believe that's the case? Well, I, I think um, it's hap what I would say is it's happening um, with breathtaking speed in some areas and with glacial speed in others. You know, so if I look at the technology sector and what's happening there and um, just the way personalisation is leading to uh, more and more accessible devices and that we have a global industry which um, with enormous reach just about to everybody, not quite to everybody, because we know smartphones are still expensive if you're in uh, uh, developing countries. But uh, with almost breathtaking speed, we're getting this um, access to these smart devices that are accessible. Um, and that is putting in, the, in everybody's hands a device that they can then use um, to access all sorts of things that they would, you know, couldn't do uh, before. But, you know, so that's sort of at the, at the breakneck speed. It's a, you know, and it's a, an industry that is enormously profitable. And so what they, you know, what they can invest in development is just extraordinary. And they need to in, uh, invest because if they don't make devices that are more and more personalised, they'll lose the race for sort of, you know, dominance in, in the technology space. But then on the other hand, you, you, you look at, um, you know, for example, some of the work 
um, that we're doing with you, Ben, around um, accessible housing design, uh, accessible design in schools. And you really do wonder about um, why there is not a better collection of the evidence. Um, and then, you know, and so building an evidence base for on which you can get sort of continuous improvement. And so I think I think the answer is patchy, but I also think there is this recognition that universal design benefits all. So I, th I think I think we're progressing, probably not as fast as I would like, but then I'm impatient. But um, uh, you know, I, I guess what I would like to see is much better collection of evidence, and then the use of that evidence to drive change in areas which are currently lagging behind, and particularly in areas where there's major capital investment. You know, if we look at the schools we build, the major, you know, the offices we build, these are 50, 60 year, 40, somewhere between 40 and 60 year assets. So building them right at the outset is just critical and using the best state of knowledge when we do each of these new buildings is really critical. And I don't think we're seeing enough of that uh, at the moment. Andrew, can I, can I ask you, you, you put up a very long list of um, policies and standards, regulations. It, 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 are, we, are we getting bogged down in, in, in some of the, 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 the complications of integrating uh, some of these uh, uh, perspectives from which we're taking these issues forward? They, um, they don't speak to, them, to each other very well, is what I would say. The, um, the party that's... Uh, it's a legacy in a way of how we've dealt um, with looking after people with a disability in the past. It's always been a government responsibility and it's been a sort of all-encompassing one and it's including housing, usually group homes and institutions, service provision, all those kinds of things. And what the NDIS and what the UN uh, Charter for the Rights of People with Disability has done is has attempted to bring people with disability into the community and to say you live where you want to live and you can do what you want you know we'll bring the service to you you live where you want to do where, where your friends are where your family is that kind of stuff um but that's proven to be very very complex in terms of a whole range of different things you know that go outside of just housing and just um where people live it goes to occupational health and safety because quite often and kate i think alluded to it in, in her presentation people with a disability will have people come to their homes and work for them. So they're workplaces as well. So there's regulation about providing safe workplaces and those kinds of things. Um, the building code itself is very unclear on a whole range of issues around what needs to be for disability. And then tenancy provisions have never historically spoken to building codes, for example, and human rights. The Disability Discrimination Act is not part of our building code even though it clearly has an impact. So it's quite a fragmented system. And so, no, they don't talk to each other very well. I was obviously work to do uh, on that front. Uh, complicated work, uh, of course. Um, look, let's, let's go back a little bit. Maybe um, if I could direct this question at you, Kate. Um, we, we've talked around universal design and the seven principles, which um, are perhaps familiar to those watching. In, in the conversations around the sort of uh, putting this panel together, we talked about their historic usefulness and perhaps the need to extend mm -hmm. the universal design principles as principles and into more um, detailed data, as Bruce and, uh, and others have already pointed out. We're, 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 what's your position on, mm -hmm. first of all, their usefulness over the last couple of decades, since the yeah. late 1990s, um, yeah. and where we need to take them into the future? Yeah, I mean, I think... I think broadly and culturally, and in a way I guess this goes back to the first question, um, the idea that um, uh, environments and other, um, other ways in which we engage with our world, because, you know, universal design principles apply to other means of uh, um, communication and, and other tools, I think the, the kind of broad idea that the world should be inclusive 
um, of all of us um, is, of course, a really important one. And I would also suggest that um, over that recently there is more alongside that discussion that Bruce has raised around um, responding to personal needs and individual needs. There is a, a, a widening acceptance of um, different people's different needs in many areas of the world. Clearly, it's not true everywhere. Um, I think that's a really difficult thing to apply in real terms in design. And um, so I tend to come around, not surprisingly, to this through education. And when I look at the kinds of design studios that are offered, uh, I know that we have a good history of um, design studios that are offered to students in um, the Melbourne School of Design uh, that address different kinds of perspectives. So, and I think I think that's a real challenge for learning designers, especially, uh, particularly in the undergrad. How do I start to think about the needs of people that are very different to my own? And I really think that we need to start there. So universal design principles can be a great way to open that conversation. But part of the reason that we developed that game space, for example, is it really has to be brought to brought to ground. It has to be made concrete for people to be able to refer to um, design precedents and refer to things that excite them as designers um, uh, in order to push that conversation forward through their own design production. Um, so a good place to start as a, to wrap up a long and winding answer, um, but nowhere near enough and, um, and something that really needs to be concretised, even virtually, uh, for, for students and others to engage with. Ben, if I could just add something to what Kate has said. I, I think the um, focus on universal design needs to be seen in the context of uh, how we think about disability. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's been a major change in the way we think about disability from what was essentially a medical model of disability, which said that a person's, um, which sort of focused on a person's um, impairments and uh, functional um, gaps to, to a social model of disability, which says that it's society that disables us, you know, that it doesn't matter how much attitude I've got or how much will I've got, if I'm in a wheelchair, I can't get up that flight of stairs, you know, and so um, it, in, there are many aspects of our society and the way we uh, and our cities and other places are designed that uh, limit a people's ability to be included. And so I think we need to think about this approach to universal design as being part of that social model, um, which says that all, um, all people have rights as citizens and that they, and, and those rights extend to access uh, and inclusion. And the way to deliver that is through universal design. And so um, I think, um, you know, as we talk more and more about citizens and their rights and uh, seek inclusion, we, we need to keep pushing this agenda of universal design as a means to an end, which is that everyone's got uh, full access. Ben, if I could just add on to that. Um, one of the things I, th I think we have learned um, is that the built environment has agency. And so what we, what we know is that the built environment can discriminate against people. And so we, that's what Kate was talking about and what um, Bruce was talking about, keeping that in the front of our mind, that we can design spaces that discriminate. And so we need to be very careful not to do that. Yeah, I think the other point to make here is that um, if you build it right, it costs a lot less than if you... Um, fail to build it right and then have to come along afterwards uh, and modify. And so I think particularly when it comes to new construction, you know, we need to take every opportunity to get those design principles embedded, uh, uh, not just theoretically, but in practice. And I think this is where some of the aspects of the building code become, you know, and, you know, the long list that that Andrew referred to um, become so important because there would be very few people who would actually be on top of all of those codes for all of those situations. And so I guess this is another point, you know, to the extent that we can simplify 
the regulations around this, uh, it then becomes much it becomes just the way of doing business. It just becomes the way you build uh, as opposed to I've got to look up this book or this regulation and look at subclause 26X or whatever it might be. Uh, and so we, we, that, that, that's also an important element in making sure that practice um, sort of matches the ambition. Benita, you um, provide a little bit of a, a critique of universal design and, and talking about, um, I guess, the wide interpretation that all principles tend to lend themselves to. Um, can you expand a little bit on, on where you see opportunity for further data collection as you'll be doing um, in, the urban, in the urban realm and, and how more specific evaluation and assessment of, uh, of the urban environment may help uh, drive these issues forward? The present uh, universal design in compared to the urban realm is just based on either the ramps or building up the ramps or having just the equal access, but that is just at the ground level. If we really get into the environments and some of the urban policies are really looking after this stress reduction and the other aspects, but all urban designers are taking a shield under the universal design principles, they just have one line to put up, adopt urban design principles and it ends there. But I think we need to move much, much, much beyond all this stuff. And I have started to make a model which has uh, different aspects, physical mobility, as Bruce said, they are really important, but it is also to include the confidence of the people, their contentment, and if, the, the environments are congenial to them. So I think it's still a long way to go. Unfortunately, in the urban realm, universal design has been more related to design journalism or theoretical, but it has not really come down to practical means. Thanks, Peter. And look, I think taking the conversation forward and looking ahead a little bit, I wonder if anyone would like to comment on you know, ha, 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 who should be involved in future research across these areas designed for disability? And is there a need for interdisciplinarity and the inclusion, of course, of people with disabilities themselves? Would anyone like to comment on that? Maybe you, Kate. Yes, I'll say yes, Ben. I'll say yes, yes, and yes. There should be the inclusion of people with disability in all of these decisions. I think that's a no-brainer. It's an interesting comment because it hasn't always been the case. No, it has not always been the case, and um, and uh, I, I'd really, really like Bruce's model of the kind of, well, the medical model versus a social model is an important filter, but then the um, I, I think the idea that people need taking care of by the state in some kind of formal way is a really important thing to challenge. Um, Decision making about design needs to be driven from a values base. And I think sitting underneath all of our learning is um, that's where designing comes from. Different individuals will make their design decisions in a whole range of different ways. Once again, I swoop back to education, of course, because I can't get off it. Um, but um, one of the, um, but importantly, um, we can't assume that we know what other people are going to need or want. We really need to listen to their needs and wants, and we really need to develop skills to understand those better. I would to think about interdisciplinarity, though, I would say that, you know, I've, I've been very lucky to have a fantastic and long-running collaboration uh, with people in other very different um, parts of the academic landscape, and um, and that's taught me an enormous amount. So of my particular collaboration I was talking about before, when I first started, I think we spent about a year trying to understand each other's language, and we had kind of no-go areas. My colleague wasn't allowed to say design for a long time because really we came at it very differently, and I wasn't allowed to say occupation. That was a rule that we had, but now we've kind of developed enough of an understanding to be able to have some very different conversations, and I think 
not only that collabor collaboration, but a whole range of others have allowed me as a designer to contribute in ways that I wouldn't have been able to otherwise, and us as a kind of an expanding group to make things that we would never have been able to make from a single, a single disciplinary perspective. So yes, yes, and yes, I say to all that you asked. And Bruce, I want and, to hear so Yeah, just, just to quickly, there's, there's a bit of irony here in that, speaking about interdisciplinarity, that building regulations oh. are, are, are a thing because they came out of the health realm, yeah? It was, it was about fire protection, healthy living, because houses a couple hundred years ago were pretty terrible for people to live in, and yet that connection between health and housing has been completely disconnected mostly now the way we build houses. And so I think that the reintroduction of, of different disciplines around what is healthy, what does it mean, what's happiness, uh, to go to um, Benita's thing as well, and include construction and building in that is important. So because it, it started there, that's why we have regulations, um, but it's the, the connection's been lost. If, if I could just add to the conversation by saying that we must be person-centred here. At the end of the day, it's the lived experience of people with disabilities that needs to be brought not just into the conversation, but right to the centre of the conversation. So one of the things that we're, we're working on at, at the Melbourne Disability Institute is, is, is just that, how, how to make sure that uh, the research we do or the research we commission uh, includes people with disabilities, how we can encourage people with disabilities to themselves become uh, researchers. But I think once you say that you've got people at the centre of this uh, need for universal design, I think it's axiomatic that it must be interdisciplinary because there's no possibility that a single discipline is going to understand all of the perspectives of an individual or um, even more the case, a group of individuals, all the people that might wish to access a building or whatever else that um, is being being designed. So um, that, com that combination of people with disabilities at the centre and interdisciplinarity in order to achieve um, the sort of outcomes that we're looking for and what more particularly people with disabilities want as opposed to what we as researchers and people on the outside might might want, I think is essential. Well, one of the points that I think we've scooted around a little bit, um, which again has been pointed out um, by the World Health Organisation in relation to this year's International Day of with disability is, is the issue that not all disabilities are visible. And in fact, most are very not visible. Um, we've talked a lot about physical access and wheelchairs. Does anyone want to add to design for what we might call invisible disabilities, um, often uh, you know, to do with hearing or sight or autism, a huge gamut of other forms of disability. Bruce, can we, can we go back to you on that one, maybe to, to start with? Yeah, so if I might just start. I mean, it's very interesting that um, some of the tools that are being designed, and, and, and let me just um, take the example of an Apple Watch and the instructions that you can now get um, on your wrist, you know, using Google Maps or Maps. You know, they were originally designed for people with vision impairment, but they're also... Um, terrific if you're a person say with an intellectual disability and you come to an intersection you don't know whether to go right or go left and there's a voice well either a voice in your ear saying go right or go left or you get a certain number of buzzes on your wrist to tell you to go right or, or go left so a, a number of these um, features that are being built for a particular disability type if you like are much more applicable uh, you know a, a apply to people with different types of disabilities. And certainly your point about um, invisible disabilities is right. It's not just about people in wheelchairs and, um, you know, people who've got a physical uh, disability. It's all, you've got to design for all disability types. Mm -hmm. I might add to that to say I think there's a, a – reflecting back on what Bruce was saying earlier and I think we were all saying earlier about putting people at the centre – is really an important, it is important to recognise the specifics of each of the persons 
and not to imagine that people with disability are somehow a kind of an amorphous but single mass. There's, there can't be a single solution here. And so for that reason, it's really important to understand the specifics of each person's need in order to respond to it effectively. And I think this is where I come to challenge a little bit. The, um, the broad idea of the universal design principles is fantastic, but in application, I think it's really important that we don't imagine a single solution is going to suit everybody because it just can't. Um, it can only be a poor solution for everybody, I've, in, certainly in my own work. I think it's really important that we see what can be shared but also what can be flexible and applied for the specific needs of, of each particular person and their disability, visible, invisible, emerging, changing over time. Um, ben, I, following up with that, I, I agree with Kate, and that's one of the, the challenges that there are so many types of disability and each individual person will have a specific combination of one or more and it, to a certain extent. And so in one way, it's impossible to sort of get your head around designing for, for that amount of sort of uh, difference. But having said that, and I've taught studios for the last few years looking at designing apartments and houses for people on the autism spectrum, there is a lot of common things that you can design in which are incredibly beneficial to a really wide range of people and that, that then you can sort of specialise and, and customise for individuals. And so what it brings into the design process, particularly looking at people on the autism spectrum, for example, is ideas about sensitivities to light or to noise or to vibration or to cold or to hot and things about fatigue and things about having clear purposes for different spaces and things like that and all those things are fantastic hooks for us as designers to design better better apartments with um, so there is a lot that you can do as a designer for that that, that, that goes well beyond mobility issues mobility issues that are kind of starting point okay the house has to be accessible and then well okay so what do we do about noise what do we do about ventilation what do we do about um you know what's a calm apartment how, how do we design calm it's, it's a great sort of challenge for designers i think andrew you've, you've probably summed up uh, the last question which actually we don't have time for because we've um, just about reached our time limit but you know where do we take this next how do we how do we create a uh, better design of uh, the built environment in the urban realm, um, of course, for people with disability. So uh, I think we'll, we will have to wrap up. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Bruce Bonnie Hattie, Associate Professor Kate Triglon, Andrew Martel, and Nina Thakur. Thank you very, very much for sharing um, your work and all of your, your great wisdom in this field. It's terrific to have brought this group together, um, you know, to, to highlight uh, these issues um, and recognise International Day of um, uh, People with Disability. Um, I think uh, we've, we've got in early, so no doubt there'll be more across the week. And I imagine, Bruce, you've got a very busy week ahead of you yeah. uh, on Thursday. Yep. Um, so look, thank you very much. And I'd just like to also finally recognise um, our Architecture, Building and Planning Faculty Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Uh, and Anna Hillerman told me not to recognise her chairing of that, which does such a wonderful job. I would um, and thank everyone who's attended as well and hopefully um, today's discussion has um, spurred you on to um, to contribute uh, in whatever ways uh, you possibly can and I'm sure our panel would be um, very happy to hear from you um, if you'd like to contact me. So thank you very much everyone, um, it's been a terrific discussion, thanks panellists again and um, no doubt we'll be uh, in touch again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Ben. Thanks thank Ben.